My name is Craig Skog. I'm the president and CEO of Olympia Trust Company. I'm also the president of the Private Capital Markets Association of Canada. I'm Phil Duholm. I'm a securities lawyer practicing out of Edmonton, Alberta. I'm on the board of directors with the Private Capital Markets Association and a member of the Alberta Securities Commission Exempt Market Dealer Advisory Committee. My name is Tommy Baltus. I'm the president and CEO of Whitehaven Investment Group based out of Montreal, Quebec. I'm also the chairman of the Private Capital Markets Association of Canada, and I sit on the board of governors for the Quebec branch of IFIC. My name is Nancy Bacon. I'm the managing director of Chase Alternatives. I also sit on the board of directors for the Private Capital Market Association of Canada, and I'm a committee member with the Alberta Security Commission's Exempt Market Dealer Advisory Committee. So the purpose of being here today is we wanted to see what would happen if we got some of the best minds in the industry together. So when we talk exempt market, we're talking private capital markets. We're talking private security. So I think a good place to start is could each one of you maybe explain what the private markets are to you in your own words? It's a small business. Um, there's an acronym out there, SME, small, medium sized enterprise, and they're responsible for some of the biggest job creation we have in Canada right now. Uh, private markets are not publicly traded, so it's not a stock market. Uh, they're generally considered illiquid, uh, but it's basically an opportunity for the small company to raise capital and get their company going. I would add on as well to uh, what Nancy just described as private markets. Um, that's one aspect or one part of the market is obviously small, medium enterprises, but private markets, there's a lot of companies that are pretty big, that the uh, family run, that have been in generations, and they've just chosen not to be, to be in the public, to be scrutinized, to have the quarterly reporting, those, all those costs associated with being a public company. So Phil, as a lawyer, what do you think is prompting companies to stay out of that public market? The driver for most of this is capital formation, obviously, right? This is a primary market. So it's companies that are raising money for themselves to go into business, use that capital, do whatever it is they do, whether that's acquisitions, operations, development. But to go that route in the conventional sense, obviously you're gonna go into the public markets. You have to file a prospectus. There's a lot of ongoing disclosure and other requirements that come with that. For very large companies or companies for whom liquidity is super important, the ability to freely trade those shares, um, you know, the, there's a pathway for that and it's very established, but it can also be extremely expensive uh, from professional fees with lawyers or accountants and even just marketing and investor relations. It's not an easy place to go. They don't need the infrastructure that exists around public markets. They don't need to be a reporting issue or otherwise to get access to capital or they can't afford it. And that's usually what drives this is people are looking at the different opportunities that are out there to get cash into their companies and finding the one that works best for them. For the most part, I think everybody is so used to the public market concept that when we talk about investing, that's obviously where your mind goes. You think, okay, they're listed companies, they're on the TSX and they're raising capital and then they trade it freely. But there's a huge other demographic of companies out there that are raising money through the private markets using the exemptions, which is why it's called the exempt market. I think one of the things that, that I've learned from speaking with entrepreneurs too, because you know, as Tommy said, there's multi-generational, there's large family companies, there's entities in the exempt slash private market that are north of a billion dollars. And there's also a, uh, a misalignment maybe of incentives when you get on that quarterly reporting cycle that you're not focusing enough on long-term value creation for your investors. You're focused on what can you do in the quarter because that's what a lot of public companies live and die by is their quarterly earnings. To your point, what you mentioned as well is there could be opportunities where you you have a good market share that by going public to disclose all that aspect may, may bring out your margins, may bring out your financial statements that may attract other people saying, oh, I didn't know this market is that attractive. Um, and maybe get people more involved into it and more competition getting into it, which, you know, depending where you are, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. But private markets um, is, is, is growing. Technology has brought the cost of barrier down uh, and it just made it a lot easier. So you're seeing a lot of good companies that want to be able to stay private for a longer term because management focuses on that long-term strategic vision. Let's talk about rules because let's remember, being listed doesn't necessarily mean there is liquidity. A lot of these public entities have very little to no liquidity. But theoretically, if you could, if stock was available, an investor could go on a discount brokerage account in Canada load up as many shares of that company as they want without any real oversight. Yet somehow when it comes to the private markets, we have 
exempt market dealers, we have, advi we have registered advisors, we have compliance officers, we, we have this large robust regime of know your client, know your products and so forth. So why is there such this divergent path between these little companies that they're listed so they somehow meet this gold standard and private market securities that have this huge regulatory regime. The reality is, is private markets haven't been really popular until the last number of years, so it's still relatively a very young industry, specifically in Canada. But because it's still so young and because the whole regulatory framework is built on regulating the public market, they weren't fully sure what to do with us. Originally, we were always just deemed high risk. You're high risk. These are startups. This is very high risk. Um, and as such, the disparity between regulation in from, for example, a discount brokerage versus in the, the, the private market actually started expanding, right? People were not deemed to be sophisticated enough or they weren't, didn't have the ability to withstand financial loss, right? Regulators would bring up that because public markets are considered reporting issuers versus private markets being considered non-reporting issuers and therefore there's another added risk element. Uh, so I absolutely think that there is a disparity um, and it's something that needs added conversation it's an ongoing concern where people sometimes seem to think that the exempt market gets treated unfairly and perhaps it does a little bit, but you can't really have the conversation without airing those two big issues of illiquidity and lack of reporting. Right? I mean, it's the very nature of the private companies are that once you purchase an investment, there isn't that secondary market like the TSX to create liquidity for yourself by selling it. Um, the regulation itself constrains that very heavily. Typically, you can only sell to another accredited investor and even then, it could be restricted by the company. They might put terms on that investment that says, you can't resell this without my permission. That's not an uncommon thing to do. Secondly, on top of that, they're not reporting issuers, uh, which was raised earlier. And if you're not a reporting issuer, you've got very few obligations to continuously update the public at large about what's going on within that enterprise. So when you've got people that can't sell an investment very readily, and don't know what's going on with the investment, that's always gonna cause a certain degree of risk, systemic risk. It's not supposed to be an indictment on the company or its operations or whether or not it's a viable enterprise. It's an indictment at that systemic level to say, this is a dangerous space to play, so you have to be aware of it. I sympathize with, with regulators trying to work through the public policy mandate of, you know, you wanna create capital formation and have efficient capital markets, but you do have to protect investors to a certain degree, and that's a difficult balance to walk. So when I started Whitehaven, I went to see my father and I told him I was getting into an investment firm. My father was an entrepreneur. He started off a few companies, but couldn't grasp it. The, the idea of I'm going to give my money to somebody else to start a business is not a bit that, that mindset. Fast forward, they're looking for opportunities where they can make some money or inherit some parents' money or take over some business, maybe sell it, and be able to run their own little family offices. And that leads to the point of education. And I find that the regulation or what we're trying to accomplish with governments is geared towards paperwork, towards high risk, this and that. But it's the entrepreneurs that you're betting on, on the smaller companies. So I find the, what we have to do in the future is that educational aspect of understanding what is the definition of high risk and what it is that you're getting into. One professor once told me in finance, never invest in anything you don't understand. Even if it ends up making 100 times your money, do not invest in anything you don't understand. But here's the question though, Tommy. Your father, who's an entrepreneur, now let's just say that he does not meet the financial thresholds deemed in the exempt market as being suitable to invest in a private market asset. But yet he's an entrepreneur. So for argument's sake, let's just say you provide him then with the education. So you provide your father with the education, uh, you provide him with all the necessary risks, you'd categorize it as high risk, he's still not able to invest unless it's deemed suitable for him, right? Why is he not allowed to? I mean, one of the things that is very intrinsic to that retail private capital market space is that it's actually unlawful for a company to sell you a security unless you meet certain qualifications. And those are called the prospectus exemptions. Because normally if you're a company, you go to raise money, you have to issue a prospectus. That prospectus is a whole bunch of disclosure that entitles you to go and sell your securities out to the public. They're presumed to have all the information that they need in order to buy. It's carte blanche, if you will, where you go and raise money. Now, if you don't have a prospectus, theoretically, you don't have all of that disclosure. So those people that are being brought into the company by purchasing investments have to meet an exemption. 
common ones are the accredited investor exemption, the offering memorandum exemption, minimum amount, a few others. But essentially what it's saying is that certain people and only certain people or certain situations qualify to access the private capital markets. So that's sort of your first barrier.